Well, this is the sixth message in our series on the books of Acts, which is, of course, the second book written by Luke, the doctor who accompanied the Apostle Paul on some of his missionary journeys. And Luke's first book, of course, was the Gospel of Luke, and he's proven himself to be a very good historian because he carefully checks his facts, and he confirms everything with access to eyewitnesses. And at the moment, we're up to Acts chapter 2, verse 14, and we're about to look at Peter's sermon to the gathered crowd there. Of course, we've been reading about the amazing phenomena that accompanied the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost, which is the Jewish festival of the wheat harvest held 50 days after Passover, Pentecost being Greek for 50. Now, Jesus had promised that the Holy Spirit would come upon the disciples, and he told them to wait in Jerusalem until they had been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came, it was really dramatic. There was that sound of a violent, rushing wind. I've heard people just say that it was probably something like a hurricane, where it's just like a freight train coming right through. It's probably what drew the crowd to the place initially, because it was so loud and dramatic. There were tongues of fire that rested on the disciples, and they began to praise God in foreign languages that they did not know, but which were understood by the foreign Jews who had come to Jerusalem for the harvest festival. And a crowd soon gathered, they were all amazed, and perplexed about what all of this meant. There was clearly something significant and supernatural going on right before their eyes. And this is the crowd that Peter would address with his sermon. Now, last time we learned that these events at Pentecost marked the beginning of a new phase in God's plan of redemption. This was not random. This was deliberate, it was strategic, and it was effective, and it marked a turning point in God's plan of redemption. The Messiah had come, he'd prepared his disciples, and now, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Christian church was born. And membership in this new church was not to be restricted to repentant Jews only. The xenophobic attitude of the Jews, which was not really based on racism or geography, it was more about their understanding of spiritual purity that they thought God wanted. But it was misplaced. It was it had been skewed. And so it had to be overcome and corrected. In many Jewish eyes, the Samaritans, they were people whose origins were from the old exiled northern kingdom of Israel that had been sent to Assyria centuries earlier. To many Jewish eyes, the Samaritans had compromised their heritage and strayed from their Jewish roots and traditions, having intermarried with foreigners, and so they were despised. And God-fearers, another group of people who were not authentic Jews, Gentiles mostly, and importantly, they did not bear the covenant sign of circumcision. And the Gentiles themselves were by nature, of course, completely foreign to the things of God, being foreigners themselves. They knew nothing about the revelations, the prophecies, the scriptures, the rich history, the law that we read about today, the law of God given to Moses, to the unique people of Israel chosen as his special possession. The Gentiles knew nothing of this. In fact, the Gentiles often worshipped foreign gods, and historically they'd often lured Israel away from worshipping the true God, and it resulted in covenant curses being visited upon God's people. So they were despised as well. There was good cause for the devout Jew to presume that God would always 
reject these non-Jewish people out of hand. So God had to really go out of his way to demonstrate clearly to everyone that even someone previously despised by God's people could now actually be accepted as part of God's people. And God showed his acceptance of them into his church by giving them the same gift that he had given the disciples and the repentant Jews and the proselytes on the day of Pentecost, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because after the apostles later encountered these peoples, as they expanded out into the territory, as the gospel spread, these peoples, these Gentiles, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they all spontaneously, spontaneously prophesied about the glorious works of God in other languages also, clearly being filled by the same Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit didn't mind communing with these people. The disciples, and especially Peter, had to learn that it was now clearly a command from God. They were not to call that which was made clean, unclean. And this, of course, has a particular warning for us today, because we are surrounded by much ungodliness, our own Gentiles, if you like, unbelievers who don't know anything about God, who worship and pursue ungodly things, an antithesis to God. There's plenty to despise in Western culture. It's full of people who have rebelled against God's created order, who consider themselves gods, who can do whatever their depraved minds think up. We must certainly reject their sin and their selfish attitude, their high-handed rebellion and the ugliness that often comes with it. But if God were to get hold of them and through his Holy Spirit transform them in their heart and cover them by the blood of Christ, and by doing so, making that which was unclean clean, then we must be sure not to reject them, but to embrace them. God may use us to reach out to those whom we would normally despise. But transformation is the calling card of the gospel. And Paul himself described himself as the worst of sinners. And yet God had mercy on him. And here in chapter 2, verse 14, we get a look at the transformed Peter, the new apostle of Jesus Christ. And as you can see today, I've come up with three Ps that I'm wanting to cover today. I want to talk a little bit about Peter, because he's someone that we see front and center, particularly in the early chapters of Acts. And he is a transformed man from what he was before. I want to talk also about preaching, impassioned preaching, because we're called to be preachers. And here we see a wonderful example of what an impassioned preaching can do. And thirdly, I want to look at prophecy personified, because in this sermon that Peter delivers, he refers to prophecies. And of course, all prophecies are pointing to a person, Jesus. Jesus is the key to understanding so much of the Old Testament. Remember the old Peter? Do you remember how he was willing to lash out with his sword to protect Jesus? But then only a few hours later, he actually denied Jesus three times. He was not the picture of the solid, stable rock that the name that he was given when he confessed who Christ was implied. You turn to Mark 14, Mark 14, verses 66 to 72. I think it's important just to read this to understand where Peter was coming from. And I think this particular incident, you can hear an echo of it in the sermon that we're going to be looking at in more detail. Mark 14, 66 to 72. And as Peter was below in the courtyard... One of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus, 
but he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystander, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of who you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Take particular note in verse 67 that they were said to him, You know you are with this Nazarene, Jesus. And he denied it. You see, Peter used to get tongue-tied. He used to get himself into trouble because of his tongue, really. He would say things that were probably not appropriate and a little bit lacking in forethought before he opened his mouth. But look at him now. Now he is full of the Holy Spirit and boldness. He is no longer hiding or denying. Now he stands up, if you look at the first verse. Now he stands up and lifts his voice and addresses this huge crowd, preaching the gospel for the first time and with authority. The new Peter, Peter the Rock, Peter transformed by the Holy Spirit and transformed by God's love through Jesus and his faithfulness to him by Christ, pursuing him when he was fallen away and being taught by Jesus. Peter, who now understands that the Old Testament, and he can see that Christ is prophesied in the Scripture, and he now recognizes the divine plan of God in history and his own part in it. Earlier, Peter pretended that he didn't know Jesus the Nazarene. But if you look at verse 22 here, you see that Peter is declaring out loud that he is a disciple and an eyewitness of this same Jesus of Nazareth. It would have been the name that many would have known Jesus by because this had been the inscription written above Jesus on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The gospel transforms. And Peter here is living proof He has gone from a broken man and a denier of Jesus to a mighty apostle of Jesus Christ, winning souls for the kingdom, a herald of God's word. It's magnificent to behold. And if he can do that with a person like Peter, he can do that with anyone, even you and even me. Peter became a mighty preacher of the gospel. And that's my second P that I'm wanting to work on now, preaching impassioned. We have here before us the first sermon actually preached by the church, and it was powerful with around 3,000 people being saved, if you cast your eye to verse 41. And this is no coincidence, because we will see in the rest of the book of Acts, preaching both indoors and outdoors is God's primary means of declaring and spreading the gospel and growing the church. No fewer than 19 messages are preached in Acts, and six of them, at least, were from Peter. And this makes sense, because as Paul, Peter's fellow apostle, and who himself has 10 preachings recorded in Acts, as Paul he himself explains in Romans 10.14, he says this, How then will they call on him on whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? The very first thing that the church did, and it is documented here, was to become active and preach the gospel. People need to have the gospel preached to them. And that involves explaining it to them, opening their minds to the scriptures, 
God's own words written down for their benefit so that some may be persuaded through the power of the Holy Spirit who reveals truth and convicts hearts to repentance. Preaching teaches truth. If you minimize preaching, you minimize the gospel and its effectiveness and invite deception and distortion, and you stunt church growth. So no surprise then that at Pentecost, at the launching pad of the church, the main event was not the sound of the wind or the sight of the fire or the speech uttered in foreign tongues. It was the sermon delivered by a spirit-filled preacher of the word. And consequently, at the end of the sermon, verse 37 says, when they heard this, the sermon, they were cut to the heart. They were impacted and they were changed. The conclusion is we must preach the gospel inspired by the Holy Spirit and knowing its truth and its saving power because it's real in our lives, is it not? Were we not receivers of the preaching of the gospel, the good news that changed our lives completely for the better? So we must preach the gospel. You must preach the gospel. I must preach the gospel. Otherwise, how will our friends, our family, our fellow workers and others, how will they have opportunity to believe and to be saved? And is this not what it means to be a witness, to tell of what you know and what you have seen in your own life, the difference that Christ has made in you? Thank God, though, but just like at Pentecost, we have the Holy Spirit to help us and to take our testimony in his hands and penetrate it, penetrate it deep into the hearts of our listeners. It is not our responsibility to force or compel people to become Christians. Some people, God will open their ears and the Holy Spirit will open their hearts to receive. Others will not receive that grace. But that is a sovereign choice by God to make. But we don't know who that is. And so we must preach the gospel far and wide and broad and then see where God may take it. Well, let's have a closer look now at exactly what Peter preached. So he begins by explaining what these manifestations at Pentecost, what they are not. They are not the result of drunkenness which is what verse 15 is all about. And he explains that only the third hour of the day, which they started their, their hours at uh, six o'clock. So the third hour means it would be nine o'clock in the morning. They're not the result of drunkenness. But then he then explains what they are, what they truly are. They are a fulfillment of prophecy. The old Peter never quoted lengths of scripture. But the new Peter has a new understanding of the Old Testament, which testifies to Christ's mission. Peter quotes a famous prophecy from Joel, the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, which prophesies over a vast sweep of redemptive history. Now listen to this. It begins with the pouring out of God's Spirit on all flesh. But note there that Peter notes that this happens in the last days, at the beginning of verse 17, in the last days. And the point about this is that the last days is referring to the Messiah coming. You see, the Jews have been looking and waiting for the Messiah to come, hoping that he would bring in the Messianic era when the kingdom would be returned to Israel. And the pouring out of the Spirit of God was a recognized sign of his coming because manifestations of the Spirit had been rare for some time, for centuries. No prophet had arisen for such a long time. And so the rabbis ex expected and taught that when the next move of the Spirit came, that was going to be the Messiah. It must be building up for the Messiah to come. It would be the beginning of the last days. So this unprecedented liberal outpouring that's described here in Joel 
and which we know happened at Pentecost, it's upon all types of people, regardless of gender or age. You can note in verse 17, it's regardless of social status because it includes the lowly servants in verse 18. And prophesying visions and dreams, well, these are all means of revelation, aren't they? And while certainly examples of all of those three things do occur in the book of Acts as we go along, the critical thing to recognize is that revelation and knowledge of Christ is seen and declared by those who are baptized by the Holy Spirit of God. The next two verses, verses 19 and 20, describe signs that are always linked to what's called the day of the Lord. And this is a phrase that recurs through the Old Testament. This is a description of the day of judgment. The day of the Lord is the day of judgment. It is at the culmination of all things. And it is often carries along these kind of deterioration of the normal existence of the world and the universe. And so these dramatic signs accompany the judgment at the end of the age when Christ returns. So Peter here is telling the Jews that they are witnesses right now of the beginning of a new age, that as God's Spirit has now come, so have the last days when the Messiah saves. And until the day of the Lord comes in judgment, as verse 21 says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So knowing that we're talking about the Messianic age and that the Messiah seems to have come because the Spirit of God has come and been poured out, the logical question is, who is the Messiah? Well, Peter testifies who the Messiah is in verse 22. He testifies to Jesus of Nazareth. And this is the heart of the sermon, of course. It is Christ-centered. It is the purpose, of course, of all preaching and sermons to make clear that Jesus is Messiah and Lord, as the Scriptures have foretold. And Peter recounts Jesus' life and ministry, which demonstrated God's favor upon him through the works and the wonders and the signs that he performed, which have been done so publicly, note, that when he's addressing the crowd, he can actually say, as you yourselves know, that Peter was now aware that God had always been following his sovereign plan of redemption is made explicit in verse 23. You can see there, Delivered up. This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and full knowledge of God. However, note that despite Christ's death being a part of God's plan, Peter still ascribes guilt to both the Jews and the Romans for Jesus' crucifixion and death. So we are still held responsible for our actions, even though God's plan is in action and cannot be thwarted. Peter then points to prophecy again, using King David's Psalm 16, 8 to 11, as proof that the Messiah, God's Holy One, in verse 27, was preordained to be resurrected from the dead so as to avoid corruption and decay. Peter uses the powerful combination of the testimony of Scripture and his own eyewitness testimony to declare Jesus as fulfilling this messianic uh, prophecy. Look there at verses 30 to 32. Powerful. Being therefore a prophet, he's talking about David, David being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, of the Messiah. So the Messiah was going to be resurrected, and that he was not abandoned to Hades, and nor did his flesh see corruption. And then he declares it. Peter declares it. This Jesus God raised up. He was resurrected. And of that we are all witnesses. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead the testimony of Scripture, and the testimony of eyewitnesses. 
And resurrection from the dead is something that only God can do. And Jesus' authority and divinity are also attested to in his ascension and his exaltation, which was also witnessed by Peter and the apostles, but also confirmed by yet another Davidic prophecy in Psalm, Psalm 110, which Jesus had also applied to himself, actually, in Mark 12 and in Luke 20. Glancing quickly at Mark 12, this is when Jesus was teaching in the temple, and he brought up this very scripture about himself. Mark 12, 35, 37 says, And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ, the Messiah, is the son of David? Because David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Of course, it's a bit of a riddle, but Jesus was leading them towards a conclusion, an answer, which is that David's son, the promised Messiah, was also God's son. God incarnate, who was before David. And before David was, he was seated at the right hand of God in majesty and power. He came down to earth and he took on flesh. And he was known as Jesus of Nazareth. He died and he rose again. And he ascended to heaven where he sat again at the right hand of the Father, having received all power and authority. Peter comes to his logical and dramatic conclusion of his sermon in verse 36. And he's based on prophecy from Scripture. It's based on eyewitness testimony. And interestingly also, if you look at verse 33, the second part of verse 33, it's also based on the fact that the Holy Spirit was still being manifested right there in the crowd's own sight and hearing. And here's the conclusion. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The evidence was overwhelming and the argument persuasive. And the people were convicted of their guilt and they called out for mercy, ready to repent and to make amends for their sin. It was a powerful sermon and a powerful launch of the church that started off with 120 and then became 3,000 in one day. It was an explosion, and it was a combination of the Holy Spirit pairing the way, the strategic nature of the festival, all these people being in one place, and the anointing upon the man to preach the word of God. Pentecost then, was a pronouncement, really, of another, another P, and that is peace proclaimed with God. Because between Pentecost and the second coming of Christ, there is this age of grace and forgiveness through the gospel of Jesus to be proclaimed by his church. Wicked and sinful people had despised Christ and disposed of him. And you know what? They still do this, even today, right now, throughout the whole earth. They ignore him. They belittle him. They nail him to the tree of irrelevance and myth. And they are worthy of judgment. And judgment is coming. We don't know when, but it is coming. But now, in between the time of Pentecost and the coming of Christ, when everyone will be judged, both the living and the dead, between that, now is the time. Now is the opportunity to escape judgment during this season of grace. Now is the time for the church to preach and take heed of preaching, learning from Scripture and prophecy. Now is the time for transformation to take place as it did for Peter to put off the old, to put on the new. Peace with God is available only for a limited time. And it is limited to being through Jesus alone, who is both Lord and Saviour. And it is limited to his church alone to preach it with conviction. And that is our task.
to preach Jesus as both Lord and Savior with conviction, just as Peter did here.